Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. This week, Real Foot Forward is brought to you by Core 10, a software company geared to solve the financial industry's most critical technology challenges at a fraction of the typical cost. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's guest, what's something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I learned a really random and fun fact that the labyrinth in the children's garden has a diameter of 20 feet giving it a radius of 10 feet. So it means that this labyrinth has an area of 314.159 feet, which is a perfect demonstration of pi. Wow, that's very interesting. I did not know that, and I will think about that every single time I'm out there. So welcome, everybody. This is a very special episode for us. Emily, what number episode will this be? This will be episode number 100. Which is, which is almost like a perfect number. 100 is uh, an incredible um, number of episodes to have uh, recorded. Luke has been here the whole time, and I have been here the whole time, and um, we've had some very, very incredible moments with our guests. Uh, but today, we thought it would be fitting to welcome two very special guests who are celebrating a 10th anniversary here with Discovery Park of America. Our guests are Polly Brasher, Discovery Park's Senior Director of Education, and Jennifer Wilds, the Senior Director of Exhibits and Collections. Welcome. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having us. So we're going to start off, Polly, we're going to start off with you. Um, Back me all the way up to when you first got involved. Um, I'm assuming that maybe you got involved with the O'Brien County Museum first. Um, maybe not. Tell us when you first got involved with what would eventually be Discovery Park of America. I have to back up just a little more to, to walk you into this, but I was a school teacher teaching high school and taking my high school students on field trips. So when you're on a bus, a school bus, not a charter bus, a school bus with 30 to 60 high schoolers, you start to wonder things like, why do we have to go so far to see incredible things? Why can't incredible things come to Union City? So I actually drew out a map of something that I wished we could have here in Union City. And I was told that I needed to take that to the O'Brien County Museum Board meeting. So I did. And they pretty much laughed at me. And said, yeah, well, we would all like that, but it's not going to happen. And then it wasn't long after that, that Robert Kirkland came to an O'Brien County board meeting and said he wanted to build a bigger, better museum in a better location. And that's when I realized that there might be a chance of this happening. And so When Robert started the vision team, it was Larry Mink, Jack Hudgens, and Robert Kirkland and myself, and we met for a year, interviewing people, doing research, making plans. That's when we came up with the name Discovery Park of America, and that's when we came up with the 18 committees that were introduced when we went public. Um, And we're going to revisit that in just a minute. Jennifer, tell me a little bit about how you very first heard about Discovery Park and how you ended up uh, coming here to work for Polly. Well, I was in my senior year of college at the University of Tennessee at Martin. Um, Martin is about 15 minutes away from us, about 20 miles. I was working at Sine Movie Theater, which is the movie theater in Martin. And one of my friends and coworkers there, um, and who also was a history major at UTM, which is what I was, um, she said, have you heard about Discovery Park of America, this museum that's in Union City? I said, I didn't even know that Union City had a museum. She said, yeah, well, it's not built yet, but they're working on it. She said, there are two, you know, they just opened um, up internships. There are two internships 
available. Um, she had just gotten one of them. She said, you really need to reach out if you want to try to, to get this last internship spot. So she gave me the information and Polly was the one who was um, in place there at that time to work with the interns. So I emailed Polly, um, you know, gave her my spiel of how I've always wanted to work in a museum, um, you know, ever since I was a little girl wanting to work around artifacts. Um, I told her I'd heard about this internship possibility and I was really interested in, and wanted to, um, you know, learn more about it or interview, whatever, whatever I needed to do. So she said, absolutely come for an interview. In my eagerness, I didn't realize I needed to have actually been signed up for an internship class through college um, in order to do the internship. So the semester had already started, so I, I was unable to do the internship, but I really wanted to be involved. Um, and I think Polly could sense that. So she said, well, you can't be an, in, uh, an intern this semester, but you can still be a volunteer. So for that first semester, I was able to be a volunteer. Um, and then I had one more semester of college to go. So when that one began in the summer, um, I was able to finally do that internship. And then when I graduated um, from college right after that semester, um, Polly was able to offer me a position, a paid position. So, Polly, take us to those uh, very early meetings before Discovery Park was even uh, fleshed out. Uh, what were the conversations like? Are you talking about the vision team meetings or yes, the committee meetings? The vision team, vision team meetings. We had this, I guess, grandiose idea. So it was about, is this possible? Can we do this? And the other side of that was sort of, or are we just crazy? And we interviewed people. We interviewed architects. We interviewed designers. We did our research on anything they mentioned that we weren't familiar with already. We would do our research on that and come back. We met uh, once or twice a week. It just, it, it evolved very quickly. And actually the decision was we probably are crazy, but we're going to go forward with this anyway. And knowing that we were going to put this in a town of less than 10,000 people, we knew there would be challenges. We knew that Union City wouldn't support multiple museums. So we thought, what if we put all of the things we want in one location under one reasonable ticket price? And that way, no matter what you're interested in, no matter what draws you to the park, you can experience all of it. And so that's what we wound up doing. And here we are, Discovery Park of America, with a great ticket price and a great location. Uh, we, this was chosen because we knew I-69 was coming through. That still hasn't happened yet, but it will still be a blessing when it does. And uh, how involved was Robert Kirkland in the vision of what um, you guys were, were doing as you went through? Was he very plugged in, or did he just give you the general idea, or what was that like? No, that year he was very plugged in. He, he attended every single meeting, was giving his opinions readily. Now, after we went public, he backed up. And he was afraid that if he attended the meetings, that people would not feel free to give their opinions. And so he backed off considerably. And then, of course, toward the end of design, he had to step back in and say, well, this is where I want my money to go and make some decisions again. But one thing about Robert Kirkland is you just didn't come to him with an idea or a question or proposal. You came to Robert Kirkland with all your ducks in a row and all your research. And if you wanted a purchase, you better have your three bids with you. So Jennifer, you showed up uh, to work for Polly. Do you recall the first tasks that she gave you as a, as a volunteer? Yes. Yeah, so it was um, 100% involved with the artifacts um, specifically focused on the artifacts that would be going to Discovery Park for opening day. Um, the, the very basic um, thing to learn was just how to catalog an artifact, which the museum term for that is called accessioning. Um, so that was the very first thing I learned how to do um, and continued to do that for a long time. 
Um, it's basically where you take an artifact and the type of information you're trying to um, find is what is this object actually called? How was it used? When was it made? Who made it? Um, who did it belong to? Any kind of history whatsoever you can come up with about just that type of item or that specific one that's in my hands at that moment. Um, we take photographs of it. Um, we get um, we take dimensions. We assess its condition. All of that information we put it into a digital file, catalog file. Um, this process, the accessioning process, is something that museums have done for years. Um, but it was essentially before computers done almost like a card catalog you would see at a library. Um, so it's very hard to be able to search through that information. So um, luckily we were able to do it digitally. So we're able to easily input all that information, have it in that one location, be able to search for the artifacts, be able to um, put its location where it was at that moment so we didn't lose it. Um, so I just learned that process. And like I said, it was just um, really focused on the artifacts that we knew would be going to Discovery Park. Um, Polly, I frequently talk about uh, this uh, evening because it's such a big part of the Discovery Park narrative. Can you talk us through a little bit of what the evening was like uh, when Robert Kirkland met at a local hotel lobby to talk about his idea with the rest of the community? Well, first they put this information in the newspaper and on the radio to let everybody know that something grand was coming and if they wanted to know more about it or have input to it, to show up at the hotel and we served dinner, I frequently say, I still don't know how we fed all those people because we were absolutely shocked that 250 people showed up that night. Did but you they, eat loaves and fishes maybe? <laughs> I think they just kept cooking in the kitchen and kept bringing it out because nobody went away hungry. But Robert stood at the podium and described what the vision team had put together and let people know that this wasn't a package he was handing to the community. This was a starting point. And that he wanted the input of the community. He wanted people to give their ideas. We had 18 committees that we knew we would need at that point. And so we had a table tent on each table. And so after he gave the presentation, everybody was asked to choose just one table, one committee. And of course, after that, they could and frequently did join two or three committees. But that night they were to choose one. We had somebody at each table to take notes and started the brainstorming right then. So just as soon as they heard what Discovery Park of America was going to be, he asked him to brainstorm and he, he asked, don't think about money. He said, just what would you like to see? What, if you could do anything at all, what would you like to see? And so, you know, we were thinking out loud, taking notes, bouncing ideas off each other. And it was a very, very exciting evening. And it, it got the community involved, and I think that's one of the huge successes of Discovery Park of America is that community involvement. And if I might insert this here, one of the things that I love so much, I grew up here in Union City, and the city-county rivalry has always been huge, and the city and the county haven't historically always worked well together and discovery park of america bridged that and i got to see that happen where the city and the county as far as the political side and the community side they came together to make this happen so what what do you suppose you know in a town of 10,000 i don't know of much that would get 250 people together in a room what do you suppose it was about the about the way it was worded in the newspaper or on the radio or you know what got those 250 people out of their homes you know out of their jobs and at that hotel that that night i can only guess that it was the mystery i had been on the inside for a year so i i was excited about the project and had not been able to talk about it which 
was probably the hardest part of the job ever was knowing that this was going to happen and not being able to tell people, but the mystery behind it. And, and I, and people were curious about Robert Kirkland too, but all of his, all of his charities were not known at that point. You know, he was very careful to name his different projects with different names so that people couldn't connect the dots too easily. So there was a, a bit of a mystery about him and, a, and a, a lot of mystery about the project. And then there are also Robert Kirkland's friend, friends, his friend circle knew what a jokester he was. And they were wondering if this was his latest joke. <laughs> so I'm going to circle back to my original answer. I think it was the mystery of it all. So Jennifer, you um, connected with Polly and she gave you some uh, 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 tasks. I'm assuming, and you tell me if I'm right or not, that you were um, spending most of your time at the old O'Brien County Museum. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so t tell us a little bit about about that facility and, and what do you recall being the mission and what what's the difference between that and, and what Discovery Park ended up being? Well, the Obion County Museum um, was uh, just a small regional museum. Um, so very, very small compared to what Discovery Park did become. Um, it was, when I began, this was in 2011, it was still open and operating. Um, I think that they, and Polly can probably confirm, I think that they had really cut down the amount of days and hours that they were open. Um, not soon after I came on board, um, they did end up closing the facility. Um, it was a mix of exhibits that the Bayan County Museum already had there, and then some other items that had been um, purchased for Discovery Park. We had a, a lot of the military items that we have on display um, here now were stored or put on display at the Bayan County Museum um, prior to it closing. Our woolly mammoth was already there. Um, so it was kind of a, um, there was a large exhibit space. Um, that was used to display a lot of these items. But then um, the facility was closed to the guests, and that was really so we could, um, you know, throw everything at the Discovery Park project. Um, and we just, the the building itself, um, I believe the museum went there in 1986. Uh, they were originally out at the fairgrounds in town, and that's where they would have their displays. Um, but then they took over that building and it was an old, it was a church building. So um, actually the exhibit space was uh, the sanctuary area for that church. Um, but, you know, we were in there, we have, um, you know, 13,000 items on display. Um, we still have about 25,000 in storage. So a lot of those items were at that location. Um, so we just, you know, would go through and, um, locate all these items that were meant to be on display for Discovery Park, um, just catalog them. We, we would clean them, make sure that they are going to be ready for display. Um, and actually, um, right prior to opening, I was put in charge of the docent staff as well. So um, at that location, it, it was because Discovery Park um, was not built yet. So that's why a lot of that work uh, was happening at the Obion County Museum. Um, so that's where I mainly worked out of. Um, Polly was there for a little bit and then eventually moved to some trailers on uh, site of, uh, on the site of Discovery Park. Um, but I still mainly stayed very close to the artifact. So I was at that building, you know, really close to actual opening day. Uh, but that's where I held a lot of those interviews for the Ardos and staff was at that Obion County Museum. So they weren't even able um, to experience Discovery Park for their interview. So it was interesting to, to try to explain to them what this place was going to be um, and hoping that they were able to visualize what I was trying to describe. And Jennifer, at what point did you make the transition from volunteer to employee? It was as soon as I graduated college. Um, Polly was the, there were, as she said, many, many volunteers already a part of the project, but she was the only paid employee at that point. Um, I was about to graduate. And it's funny because it, it was kind of a close call because the um, other intern I'd mentioned, Julia, was still around. Um, and, you know, she was there first. She was there before me. And I think Polly told me later that she 
was struggling with the thought of I'm going, I can only, I know I can only hire one person, you know, if I get the go ahead and it can only be one of these two girls, who am I, what am I going to do? And luckily for me, um, Julia and her uh, significant other had plans to move to Arkansas after graduation. So um, Polly had no choice but to go with me, but, um, (laughs) but uh, I think she just went to um, Jim Rippey, who was the, um, first CEO that Discovery Park had. Um, and I don't, I don't know how hard she begged, but she convinced him to let her um, have one employee, hired employee under her. Um, and, and he agreed. So that was me. Oh, please. Which, can I tell the other side of that story? Yeah, we, we definitely <laughs> want to hear that. Because I knew that Jennifer was graduating and I knew there was nothing else to keep her here. And she wasn't from here. So, you know, she might leave and I might not ever see her again. So I actually went to Robert Kirkland and Jim Rippey both and said, look, if we don't hire her, we're going to lose her and she's too good to lose. And so they, they agreed and offered you a paycheck. Now back up a little bit more and fill us in on you, you Polly were, doing a lot of work on a volunteer basis. At what point did you transition over to being a paid, the first paid employee? Well, I volunteered part-time for two years and then full-time for two years and then had uh, an occurrence in my life that was, that considerably altered my circumstances. And Everybody on the board knew this, but they weren't talking about it. They weren't acknowledging this. So actually at a board meeting, I said, I would love to stay here. I've already, you know, put a lot of sweat and hours into this project. I would love to stay here, but in order to do so, I'll have to have a paycheck. And they looked at each other and looked at me and said, okay, let us talk about this. So I did. And the next morning, I received a phone call from Robert Kirkland, and he offered me a title and a paycheck. Excellent. That, that's a really interesting story. I had not really heard all that. So no, I, I don't tell that one all the time. <laughs> well, you just told it to about 5,000 people. Okay. Um, so, so you now are, are the first number one paid employee, uh, and you've never you've – never, uh, worked in, in a big museum. You've never put a museum together. How did you know what to do next? Well, I didn't always know what to do. And I remember one moment in particular was when I met Tom Hennis from Think Design in New York. And I don't remember what he first said to me, but I looked at him and said, I I don't really know what I'm doing. And he looked me square in the eyes and said, but you have passion and passion can't be taught. And so that was, that was a great moment for me, for somebody to acknowledge that I could do this without the training and experience that someone else might have. So it was a lot of research Uh, hours of research if you're going to take care of a metal artifact how do you do that if you're going to take care of a textile how do you do that if you're going to put an organizational chart together how do you do that and and the research wasn't always helpful for example they asked me to make the organizational chart for discovery park of america and when i did the research there's no standard out there so i looked at organizational charts for other museums and put one together for us. And then I was attending a workshop anyway down in Brownsville, Tennessee. And I knew that some key people would be there. People that you know, Scott, Bill Hickerson and Sonia Outlaw Clark and Myers Brown. I knew the three of them would be be there also. So I took all of my work with me and asked them if they could stay after the workshop and help me for a few minutes. They stayed for at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, and helped me refine the organizational chart. 
before I brought it back. So asking questions, in fact, the way I met Myers Brown was because I had called the State Museum so many times asking questions that the very wonderful woman on the phone, I wish I knew who she was, but I don't. She said, I think you need to meet Myers Brown because it's actually his job to help people. And so she connected us and he was a, a great source of information too. And then Jim Rippey asked me to be active in TAM, Tennessee Association of Museums. And I met a lot of people there and a lot of expertise and was able to attend sessions, which is like going to class. So everything, everything I know now, I simply learned along the way. And I think all three of us can uh, testify to the fact that in the museum business, everybody's very helpful and willing to support each other and provide insight and guidance. That's one of the things I love about love about the museum uh, industry. Uh, Jennifer, how about you? You you jumped right out of college into a full fledged museum job. Um, how in the world did you know what to do? It was very intimidating, um, but as Polly said, just research, research, research. Um, she shared with me, you know, artifact-related knowledge that she had already acquired. Um, I was able to tag along with her to some of those, um, you know, sessions that she mentioned, um, and I got to meet these these wonderful museum contacts who I was able to, um, you know, as I got more comfortable. Um, be able to reach out to. And, and as you said, they're very friendly and accommodating and, um, you know, willing to, to answer my question as best they could. And um, it was just, it was so wonderful. It, as I mentioned, I, I had always wanted to work around artifacts. Um, so I was just so excited to be able to do that and learn how that even works. Um, you know, when I wanted to, to do that type of job, and I'm serious, when I was just a little girl, I didn't, I didn't know what that really meant. I didn't, I honestly didn't know if that job even existed. I didn't know what it was called. Um, so it was just kind of always in the back of my head as this kind of dream job. Um, I lived in Memphis and the three um, locations that I usually mention of what kind of inspired me when I was a, a child, um, you know, the Pink Palace Museum or well, the Pink Palace, they had, um, they have just this wonderful collection um, and we would take field trips there. And I was just always really interested in what they had there. We would do scavenger hunts and, and I was really good at it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pyramid, which is now the Bass Pro Shops, um, hosted the Titanic exhibition once we went there on a field trip. Um, and I just was always just so, I loved the history part, but I was really, um, pulled to the artifacts. I just, you know, would say to myself, oh, I wish I could take care of those. Uh, you know, I really liked the old things. I loved antiques. Um, and then another one was a historic um, antebellum home that's, that's I, I believe, near um, downtown Memphis. And I remember going there and, and telling myself, you know, oh, when I get older, I'm, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to buy this house and I'll just, I'll be the one who lives here and takes care of it. So I always, always wanted to be around the artifacts. So it was a dream just to be able to, to do that. Um, so I was really excited to continue to learn and make sure I was doing, um, you know, doing everything by the standards of other museums. And I f am also from Memphis and, and have visited all those places and went to the Titanic um, exhibit, although I was uh, quite a bit older than you. And I very much remember those places that you mentioned all being uh, inspirational. So that's really interesting. Um, Polly, you have mentioned, and so did you, Jennifer, Jim Rippey, a number of times. Uh, tell us a little bit about his involvement and how, uh, what his role was here at Discovery Park and in its uh, creation. It's interesting because Jim Rippey was working on the project, and I was working on the project, but I didn't know who he was. I would say for the first two years working with Robert Kirkland, Jim Rippey wasn't in any of those meetings. Now, that's not to say he wasn't helping on the project, but we were on different tracks for the same goal. And then Robert Kirkland told me to 
take something to Jim Rippey or go ask him a question or something. He, he sent me to Jim's office and I'm, I'm walking into his office downtown. I don't know who this man is or, you know, what he looks like, anything. And so literally met him that way by looking for him in his office because Robert sent me there. Now, having said all that, Jim Rippey has known my family all of his life. I just didn't know him, but he was working on the organizational side where I was working on the coordination side. Um, and so um, I know that uh, Mr. Kirkland was unable to continue being as engaged as he wanted to be because of his health. And so he turned to his good friend, Jim. Um, do you recall when Jim uh, was uh, given a leadership role here in the organization? That would be we, um, December of 2012. He became, he, he retired from his job at the insurance company December of 2012 and became CEO January 1st, 2013, before we opened. And I've often said there's probably no one else on earth who could have gotten this big giant airplane in the air other than Jim Rippey. What, what attributes do you think he had that uh, helped him be such a conduit to making this thing happen? Well, as as Robert Kirkland would say, he, Jim was a great organizer. He had worked for the Obine County Fair and organized all of those events. And so, he, yes, he was a great organizer, but he also knew everybody in town and probably in the county. So when we needed something, he could pick up the phone and make a phone call. He didn't have to look up who does that work, who does that kind of thing. And he would know who's super good at that job. You know, who's the best bricklayer? Who's the best carpenter? Who's the best electrician? Who's the best at moving an airplane? He knew who to call. He had all kinds of connections in all kinds of directions. And it, it, it wouldn't uh, be what it is today without his very, very uh, helpful involvement. And I know that for many years afterwards, he continued, and I know he uh, had his trusty Yellowberry, yes. which is what he called his legal <laughs> pad, you know, and, and he really helped uh, get Discovery Park headed in the direction uh, that, it, that it is that lent to its great success. So I know all of us appreciate that. Absolutely. He was, he was, got us off to a great start. So when we get back from the break, we're going to at, talk a little bit more about today and what, what the two of you do um, here at Discovery Park today. Core 10 pairs seasoned technology architects in Nashville with ambitious developers in Huntington, West Virginia and Martin, Tennessee to deliver made in the U.S. financial tech and digital banking solutions at a value. With Core 10, you have flexible, scalable access to the skill sets you need when you need them that set you up for success at a cost that keeps you competitive. For more info, visit core10.io. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave only a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps us let more people know what we're doing here at Discovery Park of America. Welcome back. I'm here with Jennifer Wilds and Polly Brasher, and we're talking about the early days of Discovery Park of America and its founding and, and how employee number one and employee number two uh, first got started 10 years ago plus. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what their days are like today. So, Polly, why don't we start with you? Tell us, what's a typical day like for you here at Discovery Park? There is no such thing. There is just absolutely no such thing. You know, I always know what the plan is for today. But I never know what the day is going to hold. And that's one of the absolutely wonderful, fantastic things about my team is that whatever happens, we roll with it. If we were expecting 
150 school kids and suddenly there's 625, we just roll with it. And um, there are a lot of meetings, um, but you know, getting to work with with the groups and the people and the teachers that come through here, getting to provide programming to our guests the, from the smallest pop-up program to the symposiums, it's just fantastic. It's, again, it's a lot of phone calls, a lot of meetings to make those things happen. But when you see people enjoying them, it, every bit of that work is worthwhile. Well, and I think you're a lot like me in that it's easy for us to sit in here behind the computer and get stuff done. But when you step outside on a day like today, I don't know if people could hear the stairs behind me, but it sounded like a herd of buffalo was coming down them. <laughs> you know, we probably have 1,200 guests here today experiencing Discovery Park. Do you suppose Robert Kirkland really, truly knew that we were going to be having this many people, you know, more than 250,000 people a year visit Discovery Park? He certainly hoped that we would. And the studies that we had done during those vision team, during the vision team year said that we would. And so I guess we kind of banked on that. But to your note about the stairway, I'm, I'm wondering if you can hear the kids. It sounds like they're going to come through my wall. So I'm hoping my mic's not picking that up, but they're having a blast out there. Um, but I will tell you this. Uh, the opening weekend, we did not have any field trips. I, I just felt very strongly about the fact that we needed to get the doors open before we started bringing in field trips. So it was about four days later, we had our first field trip. And I looked around and Robert and Jenny Kirkland were sitting in the cafe at the window so that they could see those kids get off the bus and see their excitement. And that absolutely made it all worthwhile for him. All the hours, all the money, all the planning, all the struggles through construction. He loved seeing those kids smile and see them excited. Oh, that's, that's incredible. And, and I know that we oftentimes bring up the fact, it's probably our most you know, mentioned part of our narrative that a lot of young people come here and see the escalator for the very first time. Why don't you touch on that? Yeah, the escalator is a unique experience for Northwest Tennessee. And so the kids come in and we preach heavily about keeping your shoes tied so that the escalator doesn't grab your shoestrings. But when they actually get to the escalator, they're either overjoyed and excited or terrified. And sometimes we just have to take a kid out of the line, take an adult with them and show them where the elevator or the stairs can be accessed because they are absolutely terrified of it. But most kids love the escalator. They love riding the escalator. And one lady told me opening weekend, I was going up the escalator she was coming down and she actually said to me honey y'all wasted a lot of money I said what do you mean she said all you needed was the slide in the escalator and we'd have a blast <laughs> and and to both those both of those have an educational component so that you're having fun but you're also learning why don't you touch on that a little the escalator has a glass side so that you can see how it works you can see all the motion and the way the steps change as they go back up to start their rotation again and the elevator has a glass wall for the same reason so that you can see all of the mechanisms that make it work and the slide is the only one like it in the world for one thing and at one point, we were voted the second best slide in the world. And the first slide, number one slide, was in Europe. So we like to say that we were number one in the U.S. Well, because we are. Yeah. And it's not just for children. A lot of adults go down that slide, don't they? Right. It takes about two seconds. And when people are afraid of it, because it is a little scary, I tell them, it's two seconds, hold your breath and go. <laughs> so now, Jennifer, uh, tell us a little bit about your average day. What, what does 
uh, someone in your position do in a museum? Well, I'll mimic Polly to say that even now, after this many years, still every day can be different. You know, it, it's rare that I do the same thing on repeating throughout the week. But, you know, my responsibilities have morphed and grown over the years. So now, as you mentioned, I'm in charge of the collections and the exhibits. So the collections refers to the artifact collections, which is what I started with and what I always wanted to be a part of. So, you know, I mentioned how many we have just on display, 13,000. So it's my department's responsibility to care for those, um, make sure that the ones that are that are on display are taken care of, that um, there's no damage of any sort happening to them. Um, so we go around and, and do do checks on those. The ones that are in storage, we have to monitor those as well to make sure that they're in an environment that um, will help them last for as long as possible so that future generations can be able to still, um, you know, experience them and learn from them. Um, we, you know, coordinate with people who reach out to us who want to donate or loan us an artifact. Uh, we talk to them about what the item is and, you know, we have a collection committee that meets and we decide whether it's something that we do want to accept into our collection. Um, when that happens, you know, we have to keep up with all the paperwork associated with that. Um, you know, we, we clean and prepare the artifacts safely. We go through that accessioning uh, process I mentioned where we catalog it into our uh, database. Um, and then beyond just the artifacts, we have the exhibit. So it's essentially everything else that surrounds the artifact when it's on display. So that's, um, you know, the, the cases, platforms, the artifact mounts, um, you know, we are the ones who come up with, if we're putting a new exhibit together, um, you know, developing the story that we want to tell, selecting what artifacts we want to use to go along with that story, um, you know, designing how we want to display the artifacts, how, um, you know, what all exhibit components do we need? Um, you know, what do we need to order? What do we need to build ourselves, paint ourselves? Um, and then we write the graphic text uh, that, that, you know, will accompany the exhibit. So we're responsible for doing the research um, related to that. So, you know, we research what the artifact is for the accessioning process, but then sometimes we go even further when we're wanting to discuss it more in depth for an exhibit we kind of go back and, and do even more research. Um, so it's really just developing uh, developing new exhibits, um, but then taking care of what we already have here. And what, Jennifer, is your favorite artifact in the entire building? It is definitely um, in our lower military gallery, technically, but it's hanging from the ceiling. We have a World War II era um, Stearman biplane. It's a PT-17. It's my favorite because of the memory I have associated with it every time I see it. In the early days when, when the building was complete and it reached that point where artifacts could start to um, be brought into the building, it was one of the first, if not the first, artifact um, that came into this space. Um, you know, the, there's, there's large windows on one of the walls in that gallery. The windows weren't there yet because <laughs> they were waiting for this plane to come in. Um, but before it was going to be put on display. There were a few of um, the staff members who were able to uh, go for, I guess one of the last joy rides uh, that plane was going to do before it um, was decommissioned to be put on display. So Polly was one of those um, staff members, but we got to um, go up and we were flown by Mike Rinker. And it was a wonderful experience. I was terrified, but I knew when else am I going to ever fly in a World War II open cockpit cockpit plane. Um, so I made myself do it and I'm so glad that I did. Um, but then after um, after that, it wasn't long um, where Mike flew the plane over to Discovery Park. He landed on the um, highway that's in front of our facility and um, taxied it around to the back and it, it was brought into our building and, and hung up where it's remaining today. And what are you most looking forward to, Jennifer? In regards to what? Discovery Park in the coming years. Like what, um, what's your vision? You know, the mission of Discovery Park is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. I really just hope that that will continue. Um, you know, I know what it's like to be a child going into a museum and be inspired by what you've seen, um, especially career wise. You know, I'm, I was probably one of the few that are inspired to actually want to work at that place, work at a museum. Um, but, but I know how much that affected me. 
So I know that a place like us, you know, we have someone come in who will see an object and just be so blown away by it that they either just want to learn more about it um, just for their own knowledge, or it may spark an interest, um, you know, for their career. And I know that was a major point of why Discovery Park was here in this location um, was that Mr. Kirkland wanted, you know, the rural community, I mean, children and adults, but especially children to be able to experience something like this where, you know, they would have probably had to have gone to a large city to encounter some of these artifacts. He just really wanted to um, make sure that the rural community had access to something like this so that they could, you know, they weren't handicapped in any way. They, they could still come here. They could learn. Um, they could see something space related and, and want to pursue being an astronaut. Um, just, just knowing that those experiences are still happening. I just really hope that that is going to continue on. And, um, Polly, I'm going to ask you the same question. What, what is your favorite, um, artifact or gallery at Discovery Park? That's, that, that's a super hard question because there are so many things here that like Jennifer, I have the memories, uh, the, the ordeal we went through to get the Liberty Bell here is, is a story all in itself that we don't have time for today. But the stairs in the firehouse do have memories for me because of the fruit stand that was underneath the, that staircase when it was originally downtown Union City. And that's where my grandmother would go to buy her fruit and then she would make me a peanut butter and banana sandwich. So that that's a cool memory. I mean, you you walk in a firehouse, that's not what you expect to think about. But for me, that's what happens. So um, obviously, I agree with uh, Jennifer's impressive vision for Discovery Park that we continue to inspire children and adults to see beyond. How about you? What are your hopes for the future? Well, again, it's kind of the flip side of her story. She was a child. She was inspired to work with artifacts. I was an adult when I became interested in history and artifacts and museums. But seeing, seeing the way that Discovery Park of America has changed adult lives too is wonderful. And I hope we never stop. I hope that 20 years from now, it's just as wonderful, just as fascinating, and we're still inspiring people to the level that we are today. Well, thank you to the two of you for the work that you've put into this place. I know that it inspires me every day, and and I know that uh, literally more than two million people have come through here and been touched by the work that you two have done from the very beginning. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Scott. You've brought a lot of uh, good changes and good ideas when you came too. Thank you. Um, uh, so also thank you for being on our podcast, uh, okay. on our 100th episode. 100th, I can think of, cool. I can think of no one better to be, um, on our 100th episode than the two of you. And thank you to all of our listeners out there who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here, as you've heard, is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.